Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union, What's Happening with Human Rights Around the World on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, in Moana Nui Akea. I'm your host, Joshua Cooper, and the title of today's episode is World Indigenous Peoples Day, Hope Visit, The Doctrine of Discovery to the UN CERD Review. I'm very fortunate to be joined by amazing advocates, elders, academics, and activists who are very involved to make sure that the world understands the real purpose of World Indigenous Peoples Day that really does celebrate the resilience and resistance as well as the recognized human rights and public international law. Thank you all for joining and making time to share your story about how you were involved with the Pope's visit as well as other important aspects of World Indigenous Peoples Day. Kenneth. Hi, how are you, uh, Josh? Thank you for inviting me. It's uh, wonderful to be here, and uh, it's also a, a good way to uh, commemorate uh, the world's indigenous UN, the uh, day of the world's indigenous peoples, or whatever it's called. And uh, it, it's always good to celebrate that. Uh, Cheryl, thank you for joining us from the other side of Canada and sharing with us your perspective. Thank you, Josh. It's a pleasure to be joining you and my fellow panelists today. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you as well, Michelle, for making time from your busy schedule to be able to participate and discuss the amazing work that you did in preparing for this visit. Thank you, Josh. It's a real honor to be here today. And so as the world knew and focused on what was happening, the visit of the Pope to Canada really did capture global attention. Kenneth, could you maybe share why that was so important and what were some of the highlights of that visit and the deeper message, of course, and long-term strategy going forward. That's a lot to do. <laughs> uh, first of all, the, the, the Pope's visit to Canada was a long time coming. It wasn't something that was uh, that just, you know, this didn't come out of thin air. Uh, there's been a long campaign uh, for the Pope uh, to apologize for the uh, residential schools in, in, in Canada. You know, there's been a, uh, you know, a lot of litigation, litigation for decades. Uh, about the victims of the, of the uh, uh, Canadian government's policy of assimilation uh, to the residential schools. And, and a lot of those schools were run by Christian organizations, and most of them were run by the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church has uh, never really apologized for its role in, in, in the assimilation of indigenous peoples. Uh, other churches have uh, apologized, and they have also paid money to, uh, to, to make uh, uh, settlements. But the Catholic Church was, had, was resi uh, resistant uh, to that. So um, there was a call for, for the Catholic Church to apologize, for the Pope to apologize. And uh, finally, last spring, uh, a delegation of, uh, of indigenous peoples went to, uh, uh, went to Rome to meet with the Pope, uh, invited by the Pope, uh, organized by the Canadian Catholic of Catholic uh, bishops. And, um, and, and there the, the Pope made a half an apology, I, I, I would say. And uh, the people wanted more, and he promised to come to Canada. So we came, finally came, came to Canada. Uh, 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 last month, and he went to uh, 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 three places: um, uh, Edmonton, Quebec City, and uh, another community up north. And um, what was significant uh, about that, I think that was different, was that at least the Pope made a stronger apology. Um, at first, he was apologizing in Rome for in individual uh, in the Catholic organization that made that, that may have done some wrong, and and uh, which was really inadequate. This time he was uh, a bit more uh, taking, uh, uh, saying that the, there were certain institutions inside Canada that were responsible, uh, responsible for for uh, for the tragedy tra tragedy of of, um, uh, of residential schools. But he still did not take responsibility for the whole church, the whole church's responsibility for for residential schools. So that left. Um, so that was a, a big shortcoming in his uh, uh, in, in his visit. His uh, his apology though was a lot better. Than the one he did in Rome, he and he did say he he, he asked for people's forgiveness, and, and he was a lot more sincere. The, the the I think the wording in Rome was more written by a lawyer. Uh, this time, a little less lawyer, a little bit more uh, Pope Francis, and um, what still didn't go quite 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 far enough. However, uh, 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 many of the um, uh, residential school survivors were waiting for this apology, and 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 many of them accepted it, and 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 they thought it makes them feel good, and it's fine, it's good for them. And uh, on the other extreme, there are some people who, who would not accept the apology. And, and for some people, it doesn't matter what the Pope would say, they would never accept it. 
So there was a broad range, everything in between in, 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 uh, in his visit was, was the reaction in, in, uh, in Canada. And it was, and it was worldwide, worldwide news. Our uh, uh, part of this though, we, why we were involved was not the Haudenosaunee, we weren't looking for an apology. We were there to, to talk about the, um, uh, the, the revocation of the papal bulls that make up the doctrine of discovery. And uh, that's, the, that's the fundamental uh, uh, edicts that, that um, uh, I took away the sovereignty of, well, it didn't take away our sovereignty, we still have our sovereignty, but, uh, but it made European monarchs uh, think that they had uh, sovereignty over our land and, and the, the conflict and, and the, the dispossession and the disempowerment of indigenous peoples that, 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 that took place from the, uh, uh, since uh, uh, Columbus came all, all the way to the present. And the church, we have to make the church realize that those papal bulls are still being used today by states to um, to dispossess indigenous people. So that was our part, part of the uh, of the visit. Uh, we we weren't there looking for an apology. We were there. An apology without action means doesn't mean anything. So we we need action with any kind of an apology. Thank you, Kenneth. And that of course really looks at the legal underpinnings where the doctrine discovering those papal bulls then in the minds of those doing the colonizing provided the framework to then continue the dispossession as well as the taking of lands and all the other human rights violations that were outlined in his visit that he was making the apology for. That's right. And, uh, and there's a lot more to it. And there's a lot to it. I, well, one of the things about, the, the, you know, we've been on a campaign for many, many years to, to have the, the, uh, the Pope, uh, the Vatican, uh, uh, re revoke the papal bulls, and you know, going back to the permanent forum, and, and, and uh, many, many years ago, all the way up today, and we we weren't uh, getting a lot of attention. But with the popes coming to Canada, it was national news. The the the, the doctor of discoveries and was in the major newspapers across Canada, and and it really brought forward the, the issue. And I think that was one of the most significant things that that the pope did. Uh, his visit uh, uh, brought uh, that, that whole idea of where the basis of colonialism. You know, and, and the pope when he was in in Quebec City, made very strong words about the evils of of, of, of colonialism, and uh, so that's that's what uh, the the, uh, the the papal bulls uh, uh, started. You know, the the the, uh, the the discovery of of, of new lands and and uh, claiming that land for their their monarchs and dispossessing the indigenous people and dominating the, the indigenous people is what colonialism is all about. Very true. And I remember here in Hawaii, of course, we always had the papal bulls burning for Indigenous Peoples Day in October. And it's really important to show the resistance that has always been there and to challenge those concepts of terra nullius as well. And Michelle, you had done an amazing aspect to sort of plant the seeds and make sure that this event actually happened. Could you share your involvement earlier? Sure. Um, I had received uh, an invitation to attend with the First Nations delegation that traveled to the Vatican earlier this spring, and it was to serve in the position of a um, as a, a spiritual female spiritual advisor to complement the male spiritual advisor that was part of this delegation. And the invitation first came by way to one of our uh, Mohawk clan mothers from Akwesasne. She was unable to attend, and so myself and uh, another Mohawk sister, uh, Gudji Juni Fox, we, we both attended, um, but I'm the one that went in and spoke and gave, um, I didn't give, but I, I presented a, a cradle board uh, to the Pope. So um, I was in this private audience uh, there were uh, 15 of us delegates all together, which consisted of uh, chiefs and elders, uh, mostly all survivors, and also two youth delegates to present all of the issues um, and outlining all of the historical traumas, all of the current um, uh, requests that are being made uh, in order to try to make things right. Um, and then voices from the young people talking about the future and what are the things that they would like to see. And then I closed it out with uh, just sort of like a, a, an overview to the Pope of kind of like all of the issues and really speaking to family and speaking to how this uh, doctrine of discovery, you know, these papal bulls that, that make up the doctrine of discovery, how they've impacted our people throughout time and continues uh, to lead to the dispossession of our lands and our children, even to this day. 
And with that, I presented a empty cradle board uh, that was sent over by our clan mother to represent all of the children who never came home from residential schools. And in addition to think about all the impacts that have happened to our people because of the schools, but ultimately leading it back to the source of these papal bulls and doctrine of discovery and recognizing how that the this doctrine of discovery is still used in law today. And as a matter of fact, um, I live on, on the state side and it was cited in uh, by the Supreme Court in 2005 by Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the Cheryl uh, versus Oneida Nation case, which I'm a member of. And so for me, it was really very um, meaningful to be able to travel right to the Vatican, to the source of where these papal bulls came from, and to address the Pope on the doctrine of discovery and asking for the revocation of these papal bulls. Um, and so with that, when I returned, um, I continued to be able to advocate for our Haudenosaunee External Relations Committee, for which Kenneth is a member of, um, uh, to be able to uh, meet with the Pope uh, when he came here to Canada, to be able to address these papal bulls, and also with the Catholic bishops. Um, in addition to that, um, I had uh, been invited by the Assembly of First Nations to continue to provide uh, cultural guidance in um, in regard to this uh, people visit and you know all of the different places he would be stopping but I had a special emphasis in Quebec City uh, so I was part of that delegation that traveled uh, with Kenneth um, from our Haudenosaunee uh, Confederacy to be able to go and to uh, to to meet with him but unfortunately there was uh, a lot of resistance in the sense of um, you know the you know, indigenous, you know, nations would, you know, create their agenda and whatever was sent back by the Vatican, there was a, there, there was sort of like this, I don't know, real clear sense that uh, indigenous people's voices um, were not really prioritized and hearing from indigenous nation uh, leaders was also not prioritized. So we did not get to have that moment to address the Pope, but for sure he knew that we were there and the media also knew that we were there and our reason for going as well. And that really frames the World Indigenous Peoples Day because we can explore the recent Pope Francis visit to Canada and the formal apology, as well as though what happened last month, the 15th expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous people session and the current UN committee on the elimination of racial discrimination happening in Geneva now. Maybe we could talk a little bit, Kenneth, about last month at the 15th session, there were some fireworks even before the first opening session happened. What was going on? related to indigenous people's rights that really did capture the world's attention and made people stand up and really be in solidarity together. Well, uh, I think uh, boy, that was a month ago, eh? boy, it feels, feels a whole lot longer, <laughs> like forever. Um, you know, the expert mechanism is always an interesting uh, uh, meeting to attend and I encourage people to, uh, to, uh, to, to go there if you, ever, if you ever get a chance. And, um, you know, the, um, you know, and there was a, a really good, agenda uh you know on, on treaties for instance with uh between uh states and indigenous people so it was on the agenda and violence against indigenous women and there was um you know a lot of good stuff on uh, on the agenda and the first day of, of, of the meeting after we did the our traditional opening which uh, we had uh, some people from indigenous people from mexico and uh uh Haudenosaunee at Tuscarora, uh, a gentleman do, do, do the opening um and then we had our, our, our the first agenda uh, item it was about treaties and um and uh, while the, our our speaker was uh, just before our speaker, uh, the, there was a, 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 a an indigenous uh, woman from Russia who spoke and, and was talking about the difficulties that the indigenous people were having in, in Russia. And while she was talking, or just after she talked, the the, uh, the representative of the Russian Federation started yelling at her and uh, and demanding uh, saying saying that she was uh, spreading propaganda, and uh, he was yelling yelling these things out loud. And um, and then and he and he went out and he stood up in front of her and demanding to know her name. And so he was he was intimidating her. And uh, it was all the buzz in the room, uh, wondering what 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 can we, we do? But she started crying. She was so intimidated that, that she started crying. So uh, people went up to her, started to console, console her, defend her. You know, I went up to and myself to, to talk to her, and I talked to other people, and we say we can't let this stand. You know, we got to we got to say something. So I got I had permission. 
I went up to the to the podium. I, I talked to the chairman and to the secretary, and I said, I, uh, "We we got to say something. I uh, I want to know if I could take the floor." And they said, "Okay, he will give you the floor at ten to one." And it was twelve thirty. So we went back on my way back to my chair. I, I you know I gathered a group of friends. I dictated what I wanted to say to to uh, to Ghazali, and, and he typed it up on on his laptop, and then and he emailed it to me when I sat down. They told me, "Mr. Deal, you have two minutes. To, you're on in two minutes." And just as uh, the chairman was giving me the the the, um, uh, the floor, uh, Russia, uh, the Russian Federation asked for a, a right of reply, and the chairman was trying to explain to him that you don't have a right of reply in, in the Emirate. We have our own rules here. And but he insisted to know what was the name of that woman. I want to know the name of that woman. Nobody wants to tell me the name of that woman. We have a right to know who who, who speaks. You know. And when he finally I, I kept quiet, the chairman gave me the floor. So the first thing I said was uh, thanking him. For, for, for the floor, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Indigenous Peoples Preparatory Meeting, which I was the chairman. I said, my name is Kenneth Deer. I, I don't, I, if anybody wants to know. And everybody applauded because I wanted to demonstrate to Russia that I was not in, being intimidated by them. You know, let them know my name. And then I went on to say that uh, uh, the behavior of a certain government, I never mentioned Russia. I never mentioned the name of, of, of Russia. I said, that a certain government here was, was behavior was, was, was unacceptable. It was, uh, uh, intimidating uh, an, an indigenous woman, and that um, uh, that indigenous people have every right to to speak truth to power here in this in this room. And the United Nations should, should uh, be free to allow uh, people to speak freely, and also as particularly in bodies that are are specific for indigenous peoples. And that I I said that if that person belonged to an NGO, we could pull that person's badge, but because it's a state, we we can't. So we asked the, the bureau, which is the committee that oversees the Human Rights Council uh, to take action uh, uh, against that government. And then I got a standing ovation after that with, with that statement to, to, to stand up for an indigenous woman who has been in, intimidated by a state. So that's no, the I, fireworks. That was the fire. That was the first session, the morning session on Monday morning. And, and, it, right. and it, it set a tone, I guess, or uh, maybe not a tone, for, but there was some tension in the room for the rest of the week. You know? Because there, every now and again there was the, you know, there was something Russia would, would, would respond and you know somebody else would respond a group of states uh, uh, respond the next day criticizing Russia by name uh, that that the um, uh, that they were uh, against the, um, the they had admonished uh, the Russian Federation for the, for the behavior. So no, was, I remember. It was time. And it was uh, it reminded me of. Years ago, when you, I was giving an intervention on Tibet and the Panchen Lama when we we're focusing on children's rights. And I'll never forget, you told me if they silence one of us, they silence all of us. So don't worry about them saying they'll end the meeting. Everyone should always speak. And it's great to see nothing has changed. It was great to see Guatemala and the coalition of states speak up as well. And I was just today at the International Service for Human Rights, and they're investigating as a formal reprisal as well. So the issue is not over yet. And it's and we really appreciate you speaking. Cheryl, could you share as vice chair and the North American member of MREP, what were some of the results of that important five day meeting and the exciting next steps that'll be happening as well? Well, thanks, Josh. And, and thanks, Kenneth, for giving us a, a recap of our um, adventurous first session on that very first morning. Um, I just want to take a moment to mention that reprisals uh, and concern about reprisals has always been there uh, with UN work and with people speaking on the floor. And it, it, what's new here is that it was actually happening in the room. Um, there have always been concerns about people returning home and feeling safe or even reprisals happening out in the hallway or the coffee shop. But this was unprecedented and really a deep and serious concern to the Secretariat and the Human Rights Council and um, everyone who was aware of what was happening. And as Emirate members, we felt so strongly about what had happened in the room and what is also going on relatedly around the world. We made two of our nine recommendations for the year, um, all about reprisals against 
mandate holders, um, those speaking on the floor, and also any human rights defenders uh, around the world, because we've seen such an increase in, in violence and reprisals against them. So at the end of the UNRWA session, and as Kenneth mentioned, we had a full agenda. We, we had a packed agenda all week covering um, so many important issues like treaties, constructive arrangements, um, violence against Indigenous women, um, in, in the International Decade on Indigenous Languages. We had a session on that. We had a coordinating session with the other mechanisms. Uh, we had so much, uh, it was a packed agenda for five days. I can't believe how much work we covered. And at the end, uh, Emirates together sits down and creates nine, we had nine proposals this year that go forward to the Human Rights Council. And um, like I said, two of them, uh, proposals three and four were all concerning reprisals and the deep level of concern that we all have and encouraging the Human Rights Council to take special attention and care of that this year. And we also um, are encouraging more states to get involved because what we noticed was not many member states in the room this year. Um, and so one of my own concerns was that um, inappropriate behavior by one state kind of took up too much space um, and threatened to get in the way of all of the important work that we were doing. So we want to encourage other states to, to participate in, in, in all of this as well. And speaking of participation, I think this is one of the, the biggest outcomes from the Emirate meeting that I'm really happy to report this year is a call to continue to work on the area of enhancing and expanding the participation possibilities for an Indigenous people within the Human Rights Council. And um, coming forward from that is um, a workshop that will be taking place in November uh, in Geneva and I believe it's four or five days workshop. I can't remember which off the top of my head, but it's in late November and that will be four days, Kenneth is reminding me, um, four days that we'll be looking deeper into the participation question and how to enhance that so that eventually indigenous peoples can appear at the United Nations as themselves, as their own representative institutions, that they don't have to either show up as an NGO or as a member of a state delegation, that they'll have the right to participate and speak on their own and in their own right as themselves. So that's, I, I'm seeing some movement in that area that's very exciting. No, it's, it's very true. And it goes back to what we originally talked about, that it's not having to go under a NGO status, a non-governmental, but it's being able to represent indigenous peoples, their nations as part of the solution. And Kenneth gave one of the strongest presentations, I believe, when Kenneth, you were sharing about why indigenous peoples are at the end to remind the world about the environment that they just can't seem to get. Although we see now with the record heat, it's hotter in Geneva than it is in Hawaii. Uh, this week. And so it really to remind people, think of the Mother Earth, but also of all the species as well. And it was a quite a powerful meeting to bring everyone together and to think about the next steps. And Cheryl, you really did put it to, it reminded me of the one of the committees, the CEDAW, the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women participated. But also this week, we now have CERD on racial discrimination. And that was the first treaty after the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, where they said, if you look at racism and xenophobia, that's the start of the scourge of war. So maybe, Kenneth, you could share, why is it important to go to these treaty bodies, such as CERD, and what have been some of the gains of the times you have gone forward as the U.S. begins its review on Thursday and Friday? Well, I think the, uh, the, the treaty bodies are, 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 are really important. Uh, the, the treaty or those of you know our listeners, are, are, what a treaty body is in, in the United in the United Nations is uh, is is where uh, international law is supposed to be enforced, or at least uh, put pressure on states to to listen to uh, uh, to uh, to the uh, um, uh, obligations that all the states have, have signed signed on to. Uh, so in this case, uh, the United United Na uh, United States has to uh, uh, report on on its behavior in upholding. The, um, uh, the, uh, the Declaration Convention on the uh, Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And uh, in this committee meeting called the Committee on the Elimination of, of Racial Discrimination, uh, uh, Indigenous peoples and other peoples can, can bring up uh, complaints of, 
about racial discrimination that take place inside the United, inside the United States. So uh, if you can document really serious uh, uh, instances of, of racial discrimination, you can bring it to the, to the United Nations, to the CERT committee, and the CERT committee can, can listen to your, to your complaint and they can investigate that complaint and they can make recommendations uh, 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 to the state and they can condemn the state you know, for, uh, for, for, for certain behaviors. And now, as, as you know, there's a lot of racial discrimination in the United States and in other countries, you know, Canada and, and others. As indigenous people, we we know what racial discrimination uh, is about and, and how how serious it is. And I like to I always tell, like to tell the story about the Durban Declaration. Uh, the uh, in, in two thousand and one, there was a world conference against uh, uh, racism, racial discrimination, and xenophobia. And um, and in that in that this is two thousand and one, remember? And we were still fighting for the our own declaration. There were states were still fighting against in, in indigenous people. So they. Uh, so in, in, in the declaration, there was some good language, you know, indigenous peoples should be free of racial discrimination and blah, 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 blah. Some really good, really good paragraphs. And they were using the term indigenous peoples. But, but if you look at paragraph 24, paragraph 24 says the term indigenous peoples in this declaration does not imply rights under international law. So here it was a declaration against racism was was racially discrimination discriminating against indigenous people saying that we were not people so that's the depth of the uh, the racism and and the discrimination that indigenous peoples uh, were fighting against in, in in the United Nations that was 2001 that's the 21st century states were saying that and that, and it, that they could only, they, the only time they could stop saying that is after the UN declaration on the rights of indigenous indigenous peoples was passed in 2000 and seven, which said that indigenous peoples are people and therefore have a right to self-determination and, and the protections of, of, uh, of international human rights law. And, and, and that's what's important about C, uh, the uh, CEDA and CERD and all, all of these uh, uh, international treaties is that indigenous peoples are now, since 2007, are subjects of international law and we have to take advantage of that. Thank you. And Cheryl, maybe you could share how it's been positive as well on why these instruments, these 10 treaty bodies are so valuable, including the uh, subcommittee against torture and those all together as a package, as a, a space. Absolutely, Josh. And I will share my observation. Um, now I've only been on MRIP for two years, but I've been watching as an academic for um, a significantly longer time than that. We won't mention years, but what I have noticed um, over time and if we take a step back, I think we all have heard um, erroneously that the UN Declaration is said to be not legally binding or non-binding instrument. Well, that's not exactly true because what we are seeing increasingly is all of these treaty bodies, whether it's CERD, CEDAW, the Human Rights Committee, are increasingly and sometimes exponentially increasingly year after year, how they're using the UN Declaration as a unique lens to interpret the conventions and the treaties. So that makes it binding in, in many respects. And, and we can see this increase, like I say, year after year. And I commented about that on the floor of the MREP this year because it, just in the two years that I've been on MREP and meeting with the treaty bodies annually, I've seen a notable increase and broadening of scope in how they are using the UN Declaration to interpret their own work on the treaties. And so I think this is uh, very encouraging. I'm pleased to see it. And I would hope uh, that when the United States is reviewed uh, this time around, that the UN Declaration is brought into those considerations and those conversations as well. So I encourage that to keep uh, moving forward. Thank you. And one, one I can say is there's already 20 Indigenous peoples in the room that will be speaking tomorrow at the briefing of the members. Uh, U.S. has not done as many optional protocols and has, doesn't have as good case law as what has happened in Canada. Uh, we do have the early warning urgent action and Hawaii has the Mauna Kea case and also on the Evi Kapuna of the elders and the digging up of the bones and the ancestral remains. So we'll be raising those. We really do thank you all for joining us and we have to definitely continue this conversation. Uh, of course, World Indigenous Peoples Day was named after the August 9th when we had the first working group on indigenous populations, which has now been replaced with the MRIP. And we look forward to continuing this conversation every day and so excited about all the gains 
that have happened so far and all the work everyone does on a daily basis. Mahalo. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.